Hi, this is Yifang, one of the co-hosts for Watching Silent Films podcast. In this episode you're about to listen to, we apologize in advance for the technical and audio quality for the first half. We experienced some fairly major um, technical issues during the first half during recording, and so we did our best to fix it. Having said that, hopefully you still enjoy the content. Thank you for listening. Welcome to Watching Silent Films. My name is Yifang, and with me are my co-hosts Bob and Lily, and today we have a guest, David. Hey, David, how you doing? Good. How you guys doing? Hey, David. And we're really good. And uh, Bob, Lily, how are you guys doing over there? Good. Not too shabby. <laughs> same old, same old. Different days? <laughs> oh, yeah. What we do on this podcast is we uh, select a, a film or a series of films or shorts to watch, and we talk about it. That's pretty much what we do. Um, generally, week in, week out, uh, we did have a... Uh, a listener email us earlier this week saying what is our release schedule we don't really have one <laughs> we'll release it when it's done um sometimes the editing and uh, especially when we talk about a lot of links it can take a while to edit the show notes uh before we post the audio itself so it may take a while we have i, I think at least one or, or more podcast backlog but that's okay uh, for purpose of this actual month in August, uh, uh, at least I myself and a number of us have had vacations. I think we even took last week off, and I think next week we'll, we're going to take off as well. So we're going to have like a inconsistent, you know, week to week release, at least for the summer. And it's a summer month, so uh, that's what's going on with our release schedule. So sorry for our listeners who are expecting one every week. Um, we we do try, but you know it's the summer, and so we kind of just uh, take it one week at a time for the summer. <laughs> um, I foresee that in the September we're gonna probably go back to a more uh, regular cadence or routine. Um, but uh, anyways, um, back to David. Um, he's a guest from uh, just you know we, you know we uh, we post through to a lot of Facebook groups about silent films, and when, whenever a new episode comes out. And every now and then we'll get somebody who's interested in uh, collaborating. And Dave is one of those guys who is starting to write blogs about films. And one of the uh, films he's talking about, City Lights, and how influential it has been in his life. And so I thought, you know, let's let's collaborate. Let's let's get his thoughts down. And uh, he was gracious enough to come join us and be a guest. And uh, you know, we don't have to repeat everything in the blog, but uh, David, why don't you just uh, just quickly give us uh, some overview as to what what got you interested in silent films uh, in the first place? What originally got me interested in silent films? Um, well, uh, initially, I guess, I don't think anybody actually introduced me to silent films. I think that I was just introduced to older movies. My grandmother was an Elvis Presley fan, so I was introduced to Elvis Presley movies which are probably considered more b-rated movies back in the 60s <clears throat> but uh, my aunt and uncle they live in illinois actually my aunt recently passed but they live in illinois and my aunt uh, exposed me to the day the earth stood still from 52 or 51 whenever it came out damn yankees from about 50 um i mean just a bunch of old stuff like that and um for some reason i just took an interest and when i got home i turned on turner classic movies and things just unraveled there. I would get movies from the 70s. I would get movies from the 20s. And um, I took all of it in. Cool. I, I just, I, I've just always enjoyed movies. Um, so there's a, there is a, a special place that City Lights, though. Chapel, and that's this week's review, by the way. I forgot to mention early on. But we're going to talk about uh, Charlie Chaplin's City Lights um, from, I think, 19, what's it, 31? 1931, yep. Released. released. And yep. Um, just, uh, it sounded like it, w it has a s special place uh, in your heart and your sort of uh, sort of history with uh, movies, right? Yeah, I mean, most of Chaplin's work um, holds a special place in my heart. Uh, I was first exposed to Chaplin um, on Turner Classic Movies, actually. Um, I saw The Great Dictator when I was probably mm. about 10 or 11 years old. Um, that one anyone who's unfamiliar it was his first talkie uh he made that in 1940 um and that was his departure from the character of the tramp which he had been playing since uh 1914 um yeah and 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 from there uh i found that i loved charlie chaplin and i wanted to know more and i looked at more and i watched 
the Downey Jr. movie from 1992, the, the um, Attenborough film, Chaplin. And that one, once I saw that, that's when I started to really understand the history and the, the, I mean, the life of Charlie Chaplin. Uh, he was a genius in terms of filmmaking. Um, there's no denying that. Yeah, so uh, the Great Dictator was uh, where at the end of that, basically he kind of uh, gave a speech about just... Uh, you know about freedom and stuff like that and and from tyranny from and but in a time when even before a lot of the really bad deeds came to light of what you know Hitler and all the 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 the, the powers in the world war II were doing there that on the bad side and so it just seems like uh he he kind of just it, it was a very bold movie i think uh, it was it was in that time there was a lot of push against him making that film everybody right. said no his brother who was the president of his studio, Sidney Chaplin. He right. said he explicitly That's his half brother, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, yeah, uh, but uh yeah, there's a lot of pushback on that film. Um uh there were people uh there were uh people a part of the Third Reich that had referred to Chaplin as a as a um a Jew. Um it was unclear if he was actually Jewish. He never actually confirmed that. There are reports that he was, there are reports that he wasn't, whatever. Um but uh, everybody said no. Don't do it. It's not worth. It's not worth it. But from right here, Hitler got a kick out of it. Which um, is the funny from part. my from my understanding, he <laughs> viewed the film twice. Right. Um, and there's no really no one really knows what he thought of it. Chaplin himself said that he would have given anything to know what Hitler thought of his movie. But my question is, I mean, it's not a question, but you know what? He saw the movie once and then he saw it twice. Why did he have to do it twice? And then he banned it in Germany. It was banned in Germany for decades. All right. It's the one walking contradiction, right? Nobody else can see it, but I will see it. Yeah, times. exactly. <laughs> it's, I mean, it, yeah, it goes the same way as, you know, he wants a pure Aryan race, but he has a brown hair, brown Nice. Doesn't make that's, his, that's, that's his that's his final, final appearance, appearance right? right as the yes. as the uh as tramp. the tramp yes he made the appearance at the beginning of the great dictator as the tramp initially so um so the tramp like i said his that character started in 1914 so the transition to silent films came in uh from silent films to sound to the talkie era came in 1927 and Chaplin had a lot of, there was a lot of pushback. He's like, no, it's a fad. It's going to go away. There's no way it's going to stay around. And <laughs> he ended up making two more silent films in that era uh, of, of, of talkies, of, of sound films. Um, but Right, you're talking about City, City Lights, Lights and Modern Lights Times, right? right? City Lights and Modern Times, 31 right. and 36, yeah. And, yeah, um, yeah. But, but, but he had said the day that the tramp speaks is the day that the tramp dies. Hmm, and right. so you know what? He let the tramp speak in the great dictator at the very beginning and you never see the tramp again right. ever. Mm-hmm. So he stood by that. So let's, uh, let's get into city lights then. So, uh, let's start with, uh, Bob and Lily. You had any thoughts? what do you think overall? I think I have for not seeing many silent films before our podcast. I believe I have seen a bit of city lights. I couldn't tell you when or where, but I significantly remember, like, him going up to the blind woman and, like, that whole scene. Mm. And I think possibly with the rich man uh, that he was invited into his home. There's, like, certain sections of this film I've definitely seen some at some point. Because it was recognizable to me. But mm. seeing it straight through, I hadn't watched it. Um, So, for me, it, this... I don't know if this is fully... A Charlie, I, well, I'm trying to think if I watched a full Charlie Chaplin film in the past. I think I have. Um, in high school, we were supposed to do, I think, movie stars for my drama class. And this is over 10 years ago. So I did pick Charlie Chaplin. So I looked up a bit about him. Honestly, yeah, I honestly, I couldn't tell you what I did or what, if I even read his biography, if my high school library had it, but. I know I a bit about it. I have it sitting right in front of mm-hmm. me. It's like 500 pages long. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I definitely didn't read it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I did watch Robert Downey Jr.'s take on Chaplin. So the 92 film. That was really good. I love that movie. I'll watch it. I'll watch it every year. I love it. Mm-hmm. And then, unfortunately, all I remember about Charlie Chaplin is when he died because it was Christmas. Mm-hmm. That's awful. <laughs> um, 
you know, Christmas besides being so accomplished. Yeah. Um, I don't know what else. I enjoyed the film. Some things I th- thought reminded me a bit of like British slapstick humor where they didn't seem to go as fast as you would think it would in any other situation. That was just like a me thing. But I don't know. That's kind of just my take on the whole film. I definitely would watch it again. Bob? I liked it. I liked it a lot. I mean, I've seen it before, and uh, it, but, but it was really wonderful to see it again. I haven't seen it in a long time. Um, you... um, Lily, I just wanted to address the fact that you had said that you had probably seen um, City Lights or parts of City Lights before, and uh, that's probably true. It's the number, it was ranked by American Film Institute as the number 11 greatest film of all time. Oh, and it's, wow, ranked, wow. it's ranked as the greatest romantic comedy of all time. So mm-hmm. it's it's been used in film classes. It's been used in clips. It's been used everywhere. City Lights is very well known, even if you don't know silent cinema. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah, I did take a film class in high, not high school, in college myself. Once again, I couldn't tell you if we looked at City Lights. We possibly did. But I, that is really fascinating. I love the film. I I have seen it before. It was great to see it again. I do I do like it very much. Um for many reasons, um, which, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll dig into the reasons. Um, i like to hear those, Bob. <laughs> You'd like to hear yeah, them right too. now? <laughs> yeah, right now. <laughs> um, it, I think when I watched Chaplin, who, and I, and David, I agree with you, I'm a huge Chaplin fan. I love the way he toys with the viewer, um, that, he, the way his simple movements um, in the store window, um, when he's helping the the wealthy man out of the water, when he's trying to commit suicide, um, the way he's the way you you see things coming and they don't happen, and then they happen. <laughs> he says, "We're not going to give it to the audience when they when they expect to see it." You know, it's like. Um, you know, he's stepping back and the lift is going down into the sidewalk so he can fall. And he steps back and you see he's facing the the store window. And it's wonderful because he knows how many steps and how far to step. You know, so he doesn't actually step into the pit. Yeah. I wish you guys had read had read my blog because I, I, I talked about the sidewalk scene quite a bit. Yeah. Um, I talked about uh, his movements because they were all very intentional. Um, yes. Chaplin, yes. Chaplin said, everything I do is a dance. I think in yep. terms of yep. dance. I Charlie like Chaplin that. was, like was a train. He was, I mean, he's a trained musician. I mean, he was a trained performer. His, he had been performing since the age of six. The guy knew music. Mm. He knew ballet. He knew symphonies. He understood how to bring it all together. And at that time, it wasn't happening it wasn't happening in cinema people weren't combining music right, and film right. Pe- like a lot of the times people were using music as a distraction it wasn't um it wasn't a, a storytelling tool chaplin right, took right. it upon himself to use that um to use that as a storytelling tool and you spoke of it perfectly i mean like my favorite scene in the entire film is the sidewalk elevator scene and yeah. that's five minutes into the movie he's moving back and forth and you can see the dance, the ballet, it's beautiful and it's perfect. And the thing, the thing that upsets me about the scene though, is that there's absolutely no record of the scene at all. Like I don't, I don't know how it was shot. I don't know how long it took. I don't oh, know how many takes it took. I see. I don't, cause, cause I mean, there's, there's, we'll get into more of this later, but there's a scene in the film that took 342 takes. Wow. So, I mean, like, I, I like, I, like I want to know, what happened with this scene? Because that is very um, intentional, and, yep. and you have to get that right, you know. And I don't know if there was a lot of practice, or if you had to take yeah. a couple takes. You know what I mean? But that's, I mean, yeah. that's fairly typical of Chaplin. He doesn't reveal the how the sausage is made. You know, that's, yeah. that's the whole thing about him. He doesn't yeah. want to destroy the illusion that yeah. film is magic. Yeah, I was only giving a couple examples, and I was uh, for the sake of explaining what I like about the movie. In, in all, there is in so many of the scenes, I mean, yeah, I could go on and on giving different scenes, but that's what I meant when I said now. We can, <laughs> we, can kinda kinda, like... we can kind of all get into it, but you know what? Let's let's do this. Let's 
go backwards a little bit, and then we'll, we'll kind of dive in scene by scene. So uh, let's, uh, David, set up um, what the context of when this film was made. Like, let's talk about, like, what's happening up to this point with uh, the circus and, you know, about his okay. mom and all that stuff and the divorce and, and the kids, and, and then we'll get into City Lights. It's sort of the, the, the period of time before he started to make – City Lights, set that up, and we'll get into City Lights after that. City Lights, oh, I'm going to start just by telling you when City Lights started shooting. It started shooting in 1928, so we're going to work around that tam- that timeline here. Started shooting in 1928, finished um, full editing early 1931. So before that time, I mean, you had the kid, you had the circus, you had the immigrant, you had the idol class, you had the gold rush. I mean, there were so many... Today, these films are still relevant. I mean, if, if for film students at least, I don't know about the normal person. But I mean, uh, uh, we had just entered the sound era. We just entered talkies, and so Chaplin was having this self-esteem issue. He was, I mean, it was uh, he made uh, he made the circus in 1928. So that was the year after the jazz singer came out. The jazz singer with Al Jolson is what mm-hmm. initiated the sound era. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, so the circus was already, I mean, he made the circus and then he made city lights and then he made modern times. There was three movies. There was a span of nine years that he refused to go into the talking era because he believed that it was a fad. And so anyway, <laughs> I speak about this right now because it had a lot to do with uh, who he is as a person and his self-esteem, and he didn't think that he was going to make it as a sound actor. And that's not uncommon. That was not uncommon for silent actors at that time, actors and actresses. They, there were many, I mean, I, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Sunset Boulevard, but it's, it's com- I mean, it was common. Mm-hmm. People didn't make it. They didn't make that transition. It, uh, there were, silent cinema is based purely on your physical movements. It's based purely on uh, physical comedy. It's slapstick. You know, when you went to the talkies, when you went to the sound era, all of a sudden we're talking, it's literal conversation. You're getting all the emotion from literal conversation. Um, right. so, so anyway, um, uh, uh, his, I don't know if you guys are too familiar with the um, biography of Charlie Chaplin, but um, he was... Out of curiosity, that 500-page book, was it... Um... Who is that? Uh, who, who's the author of that one? Technically, it's Charlie Chaplin. No, no, that's the autobiography, right? But he, he wrote one himself, but he also had a, many biographers over the years. Oh, oh, oh. I mean, he had a good one called his uh, Chaplin, His Life and Art. I believe that was written by um, David Robinson, maybe? Yeah, that's that's usually the reference. Is that that is, uh, that's a big one for Chaplin. But personally, for my reference, I've always used his autobiography. Right. which is called My Autobiography. And um, there's a lot of things that were revealed in there that people didn't know prior. But you, you have to remember, like all silent films or any stars, really, especially from that era or even now, when you write an autobiography, it's from, it's like, sort of like Facebook. It's kind of like the best version of yourself. Sure. You know, and, I don't know about that, have though. Have you, I don't know about that, though. Have you ever read this autobiography? Because he says some stuff about himself that isn't that great. Not, not not his, not his, but uh, I would say I've read others, and I would say that bi- autobiographies in general are, are good, but y- you can't really be, like, totally objective. Like, you yourself, if you write one, it's from your perspective, right? Yeah. There's, there's only one perspective that you know of, but when other people write about you or talk about you, they'll see you in different lights that you, you can't really see yourself because it's from people who are looking at you from external to you. You know what I mean? Sure. So you have biographies kind of fill in some of the gaps, but and especially around that time, too. I think there was like, wasn't there like one movie he didn't even talk about uh, in um, in his autobiography that he didn't like it so much? And there's a good chance that it was a woman of Paris, but I yeah, it was either that or, or I, I can't remember now. But the, you know, it, it it's it's a filtered view, so. But anyway, go on. So the, I, just, I want to focus on what was happening right before City Lights, which is like the whole Lita Gray issue. And do, you, do you want to jump in with some of that? Because I, 
I, I know quite a bit, but I don't, I mean, he had like eight wives, you know. So. <laughs> yeah, he's yeah, uh, he typical of the people of the era. <laughs> it's not just him, so, but. Because Lita uh, Gray, I'm uh, not familiar. I'm familiar with Paulette Goddard. I'm familiar with, with, his, with some of his other wives, but Lita Gray, I'm not. Yeah, this is technically the, the, the second one. Uh, the first one, you know, was teens and they got divorced. It didn't work out. There was a miscarriage which led to the kid, you know, 1920. So that's the first first one, but the, this is this one is the uh, Lita Gray where they she's she was sixteen and he was thirty five and under a California law statute it's statutory rape so he arranged the marriage uh, in Mexico in nineteen twenty four, and then they basically that's where their first son Charles Spencer Chaplin Jr. and then was born in nineteen twenty five and then Sidney Earl. All right, so we're just talking about uh, the context is that uh, Lita Gray's sort of kind of bitter divorce with uh charlie chaplin and so how uh, long were they married before they divorced uh from the actual marriage 24 like two years two years yeah a two couple years, of years. Yeah. when Sad, was huh? the divorce done 26 yeah a couple of years so yeah, basically she sad. leaked some stuff to the press about you know chap accusing chaplin of infidelity abuse and quote unquote perverted sexual desires it's sort of like it just looked bad on him, and he yep. Chaplin is a guy who, of course, uh, cares a lot about what other people think, you know, mm-hmm. and um, and so this this really reflected, I think, badly on him. And then he ended up settling. Yeah, and that's why because it, it, he was just like, I want this to go away, and so yep. over half a million dollars in the twenties—that's yes. crazy money. Yeah, six hundred thousand wow. dollars, and that's when he. Before it was settled, then he started working on the circus. And while he was working on that, is that when his mom died? When did his mom die? Oh, man. I don't even know when his mom died. I think his mom died pretty soon after around the era. I'd have to see what year it was. Died in 1928. So, yeah, that would be the circus. Yeah, so probably when that was winding down or toward towards the hell and he so he's basically dealing with uh I mean about two or three things I think at the same time. One he was dealing with uh sort of the you know, having kids now and also being a new parent, but also like you know, going through a divorce and two he's and also bitter divorce and all that stuff and, and the media backlash off of that. Two, he's dealing with his mom, who, you know, can you give us some background on his mom? I mean, I was originally going to interject and just say that, I mean, him and his mom didn't have the best relationship in his later years, in, in their later years. And I don't say that, it's not insensitive towards Chaplin at all. It's that his mom was in a, was in a mental institution for a lot of her, a lot of her later life. Um, right. Like... The last 20 years of her life i want to say mm-hmm. i don't know exactly but but it was somewhere around there so she didn't she didn't have a great uh, you know a great time in the end and 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 um i think his father was also somewhat crazy i think he was an alcoholic and so chaplin distanced himself him, himself from his mother because he was this is speculation but it seems that he distanced himself from his family like that because he just didn't want to he didn't want to be anything like that i don't know yeah, so when his yeah you know, he grew up in uh, England and you know he's born to Hannah his mom and uh, Charles Chaplin Senior uh, in uh, 1889 and they've gone through a lot of stuff but um, this is where his uh, half brother Sidney was born because his mom uh, had an illegitimate child but long story short uh, you know the 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 father ultimately both of the both of them were in the t- entertainment business so in general you know with the the concert halls and his father would often play like drunks and stuff like that like as a theater trope right as part of his act even though he was also in real life one in real life well and he died the part when you are one right yeah and he died a uh, uh, cirrhosis of the liver so that's how he died just like basically drunk himself to death essentially. Yeah, and surprised. after that, uh, basically, you know, uh, you know, uh, Char- Charlie Chaplin's mom was basically a single mother. Now, back in those days, there weren't really a lot of other options for work. And so basically, 
her mother was forced to send uh, Charlie Chaplin to work you know, at, at one of those things that you hear about in history where kids are forced to work hard labor and that's what he was doing, you know. And so he was sent to these workhouses and also through different homes, basically, you know, kind of living in a very kind of uh, uh, just very poor economic social status lifestyle. And that ultimately, I don't know if it was that or something else, but it ultimately uh, deteriorated, her mental status deteriorated to a degree where she had to be committed to the mental asylum. And um, so, you know, she was in and out, but around when Charlie Chaplin was 14, she fi finally kind of got committed permanently, basically. And there was a period of time when Chaplin then was a 14, he was like basically homeless. You know, when you think about the tramp, the character, well, he lived it, right? So he, he had this in, in Kennington where he was uh, around and living. Uh, the, all, all, I'm telling all this because all of this is replicated in City Lights in many other films, mm. where if you look at the sets, like a lot of people who are from the area in England are like, wow, this is like like this Kennington area. It's like, and, and that's what he was trying to do. He's replicating all of these things that he had he grew up with uh in in deep poverty and so mm -hmm. and ultimately his mom was committed to the asylum and he he kept he sort of would would help her uh be in the asylum but then there's nothing else to do that's one of his quotes is there's nothing we could do but accept poor mother's fate right so anyway she she, she would re re remain committed until she died in 28 if i if i could just uh Go ahead. yeah um a lot of what you were just saying with his mother and his early childhood and stuff. I, um, are any of you guys familiar with The Kid? Oh, 1921? Right. Yeah, The Kid, yeah. One okay. of my favorites. Okay, okay, great. I'm glad that all of you guys are familiar. That's like one of his greatest movies. That was his first, mm -hmm. first like, like big silent film. I think it was his first big feature film. Um, his, he was making short films up until 1922. So The Kid, uh, yeah, The Kid was definitely his first feature film. But anyway, um, speaking on what you were saying about his mother and his childhood and stuff, a lot of what he was, a, a lot of the experiences that he had then had a, uh, had a huge impact on what he did with the kid. Um, that, that movie, I like, that movie will get me every single time. Like, it doesn't matter how many times I watch it, I will tear up every single time Chaplin hugs Jackie Coogan and tears up. Yeah, I'll tear mm -hmm. up every single time. <laughs> yep. You know, what's amazing is that I read, I, I went, I perused a list that was on one of the silent film sites I like to go to. And it was a list of the top 100 silent films of all time. And I went down the list from 100 to one and the kid wasn't on it. And I went, oh my oh, God, I'm throwing this list out the window. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, I agree with that. <laughs> what? Yeah, I was like, what? <laughs> It is definitely, I, I, I've seen all of uh, Charlie Chaplin's films, uh, all of his stuff that he directed, also the stuff that is at least as available to me in the, in the shorts too, but most of us, and, and I would say that I still hold up the kid just because he does get personal later on into sort of his uh, life where he gets, uh, um, what's that, uh, the McCarthy era, he gets uh yeah, yeah, branded yeah. as a, a communist and basically uh Dear for you and limelight yeah so there's a few movies where he talks a little bit about that but i would say oh. the kid is probably his most personal in terms of his life his early childhood life for um, sure absolutely out of his, all of his filmography so that's that's, that's why i really love that one and enjoy that one myself but anyways getting back to the city lights i just wanted to set that back ground to say that that's you know he even had to take a break from circus to, before he completed for like 10 months to to just kind of settle down and that's kind of uh towards the end of that that's oh that's right he he omitted the circus from the autobiography because it was such a the way he remembered it was so contentious just because mm. of so many different things that was going on well that 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 makes sense because in 1967 he went back to the circus and he did things to it he changed yeah. it yeah he he well he he edited almost all of his films except for uh city lights and he re-recorded the scores too for a lot of them especially the features mm -hmm. he he redid all the features 
he did the score the big scores that he did that were different were uh he did the gold rush in 1942 and he did the circus in 1967 all right but he also scored the kid and then also rescored uh the woman in paris he every single feature that he did he basically went back and rescored everything so that it's all it really he was uh and still is one of the most amazing sort of accomplished auteurs even before the term author was coined if you know about film history the term auteur it's been bounced around since the 40s and 50s by different reviewers and articles and film historians. Uh, but it, it, it often attributed uh, to a bunch of a uh, couple of French uh, reviewers. I can't I remember their name now, but Truffaut ultimately is often uh, one that is, I, I guess, attributed with uh, using that uh, to great renown. But, you know, it's like many things. A lot of people have had their hands in it uh, over the years. But anyway, so. Out of anyone that you would call it Artur. I, I, I mean, if, if you use that word on anyone, it's Chaplin. He, he did everything for most of his That's films. That's what I mean. Act, That's what I mean. To writing. Yeah. To, even to the set, it, even the costume, the writing, like the producing, down to the, the editing. Down it's crazy. To the, down to the very like last details of the film. Yep. I mean, he, uh, other actors would say like, if he has, if, if there was a way for him to play every role, he would, right? He would have yep. played every role. Yep. Imagine if you transported uh, him to today's CG world. That, you probably would have uh, played every character in a CG movie, right? <laughs> it's, it's actually funny that you say that because I recently read something that said, um, I forget the name of the actor, but he was one of the actors in City Lights. If you guys remember at the beginning, before the, um, the, uh, the store window scene at the very beginning of the movie, he gets shot by the, the, the pea shooters, little kids. Mm-hmm. One of the one of the little kids said in an interview in the late '80s or early '90s that uh, Chaplin would do in that scene that he went to every single role, every single role that was within that scene, acted it out for them, and then gave the characters back to everyone. Mm-hmm. And this and this and this kid, yes, boy. Robert Paris, yes, that's his name, and and uh, he yeah. He said that if Chaplin could play every role, he would. Uh, Eddie Murphy. <laughs> He's an Eddie Murphy. <laughs> no, it's a bad comparison. Before Eddie Murphy is, is the point, you know? Before Eddie Murphy, right? So yeah. That's the point. yeah. So, so uh, that's, that brings us basically to the film. So that's why I wanted to, to um, set that background up. Because uh, towards the end of the circus, there were some characters in there that it was like some like a, a a character in there was kind of blind or something like that, and he kind of u- utilized that as a jumping off point. Like, what if you could do this? And he st- started to play around with this plot. Yep, and it all all grew from the circus. Yep. Right, um, I, I guess technically it grew from the circus and from his uh, 1921 film, The Idol Class, because that millionaire subplot within City Lights that started in The Idol Class. Right, which, which of course, all of which, a lot of which just dates back to his vaudeville days, right? Like, like yep. many vaudeville stars who are in silent films. Yeah. A lot of the shticks, a lot of the, the gags, they all go back and trace back to the stage. Hello again. This is Yifang, one of the co-hosts for Watching Silent Films Podcast. I'm sorry to keep interrupting, but I just wanted to chime in here and say that this pretty much concludes our podcast. I know it's very sudden. Um, I will say that we kept recording, and from the time that we kept recording onward, uh, it became more of a scene-by-scene analysis of City Lights. We will be publishing that as the next episode. So if you are interested in a scene-by-scene analysis of City Lights, uh, stay tuned. It will be in the next episode. You can find more of our stuff at watchingsilentfilms.wordpress.com. Again, that's watchingsilentfilmsplural.wordpress.com. That has a link to all the different platforms uh, that we're pushing out this podcast. Please leave a comment Uh, at the Apple Podcast so that other film lovers can find us. We greatly appreciate it. If you have any questions, thoughts, or comments, please email us at watchingsilentfilms, plural, at gmail.com. Again, that's watchingsilentfilms at gmail.com. Thank you for listening. We're signing off. Bye-bye.